Welcome everybody, my name is Jeff Fowler. I'm with the Apartment Owners Association and we're here today to learn how we can repeal the death tax. And um, so we have a great speaker with us. Before we get started, a little bit about our, our organization. We're one of the largest individually organized groups of apartment owners in the state. And uh, we are here to just give you ideas and how you could make more money, how you can save more money, what you can do to, to streamline your processes so that uh, your job of providing housing is more enjoyable for yourself and more rewarding. And uh, so there's a lot of different things that we do. Today, uh, it's political action. That's one of the things that we do among many things, many services that we provide for you. And really, uh, the thought is, is that we all have to be involved. It's grassroots. And so we've had the, we've had the, um, the protests, the write-in protests that we've been doing, thousands, literally thousands of you have done that. And we are so proud of you and that you've taken action, that you've exercised your right uh, as an American citizen. And so thank you, thank you for what you've done there. And those of you in Santa Ana, we sent out an email earlier this week and uh, hopefully you've, you've gotten to sign the petition to stop rent control there. So there's always things that we're doing, hopefully locally, um, as much as we can. And um, we just continue to encourage writing, writing into your local city council members, uh, especially about the eviction moratorium and how it's harming you. And uh, anyway, uh, we have lots of different YouTubes that we do, live streams that we do. Uh, about two weeks ago, we did one on how to prepare for small claims court. And in about two weeks, we're going to skip Thanksgiving. And in two weeks, we'll have one about renter's insurance and why it's important for you to have that. It's something that's in the AOA lease agreement, but it's there for a reason. And it's good both for you and your tenant. So tune in for that and you'll learn about it. And um, yeah, so we're one thing that you can do, you, know, you don't even have to pay money for, is sign up for our newsletter. If you go to AOAUSA.com and then scroll all the way down to the bottom on the right side, there's a little, I mean, not, yeah, on the right side there, there is a place for you to put in your name, email address, and zip code. And based on the zip code, you know, like we did with Santa Ana last week, we send out information that'll help you be politically active, but also just be aware of what's happening in your area. And so um, this is, okay, and so you're here, and I believe you're here because you want to stop, uh, you want to repeal this death tax. And so if you like this video, if you hit the like button on it, uh, it will help get it out to more people. So one little thing that you could do is just hit the like button. If you like John Kupal, if you like Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, hit the like button because this will help get the word out on what they're trying to do. And we're going to do whatever we can uh, to help them with this initiative that they're going to be talking about. And um, right, so this is... Uh, this has been sponsored by AOA as well as Livable, and uh, they have Rubs software. It's uh, really uh, something that everyone can look into for sure, even if you're in a rent-controlled area. And um, so I'm going to just get to our speaker today. He's the president of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Foundation. And uh, for all of you who may or may not know, Howard Jarvis, the late Howard Jarvis, he was the author of Prop 13. And uh, that, w that was just, uh, that's been such a protection for us as um, uh, rental property owners. And that was back in 78, I believe. And um, so Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Foundation, it's the largest in California. They have over two th 200,000 members. And um, what they're, they are here to protect property owners and get you tax relief. And so they're an, a great organization. I really encourage you joining and supporting them. They do all kinds of litigation on behalf of, uh, well, yeah, just fighting for our rights and to keep the taxes down. So definitely look into them. There'll be links uh, at the bottom of this YouTube video. And um, if you're on the AOA USA website, you can type in a question where the blue help button is. You can click on that, type in a question, and they'll feed that to me. And of course, uh, from YouTube, you can write your questions in. 
And so, yes, yeah, so our, our speaker today, he's the president of Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. He's also the chairman of the Howard Jarvis um, Fund that they have. What is it? Taxpayer Foundation, yeah, pr the funding that they provide litigation educational services. And he does write a weekly column there. And so you can, there's so much, so many good resources from him that you can subscribe to. But he was uh, one of the main star, he was the principal drafter of Proposition 218, the Right to Vote on Taxes Act back in 96. And man, that's been a lifesaver, has it not? And so it, he's just so, he's had, he's so accomplished. I'm not going to go through all of it, but it really is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Kupal. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Kupal. I'm president of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. So happy to be here with AOA uh, for another informative uh, webinar. Uh, a little bit of a talk on perhaps one of the most important issues that are facing the apartment community. Um, this is going to require a little bit of an explanation, but one thing that happened last year that you may not know happened, and that is you are subject to a brand new, very significant property tax that will be triggered in when property is inherited from your parents or to your children. So how did this all start? This all started back with, of course, Proposition 13. And most of you understand how, prop if you're a property owner, if you're an apartment owner, you understand how Proposition 13 works. Prior to 1978, the average property tax rate in California was about 2.6%. People were literally being taxed out of their homes. Properties were becoming more expensive. And of course, because property was becoming more expensive, rents were going up as well. So the property tax situation in the 70s was bad for homeowners, it was bad for businesses, and of course it was bad for tenants. So one of the things that happened was that Howard Jarvis, uh, who is the founder of our organization, and who also was the executive director of the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles, uh, knew that something had to be done. And he tried several times to get tax relief for the homeowners and property owners of the state of California. And he failed several times, but 1978, the stars were all in alignment and he uh, successfully proposed Proposition 13, which significantly reduced property taxes in the state of California. So very briefly, what did Proposition 13 do and why is that relevant to what just happened last year? Well, understand this, Proposition 13 reduced the tax rate but also put in a very important protection, which is to limit the annual increases in taxable value to 2% per year. So even if your property, your home, or your apartment building doubled in value in one year or two years, your taxable value, the value against which your property taxes are based, would be limited to only go up 2% a year. Now property is under Prop 13, property is reassessed to full market value when it changes hands. If you sell the property, the new home buyer uh, gets a new Prop 13 base. They do get the benefit of the 1% limitation, and going forward, they get the benefit of that limitation on annual increases in taxable value. But they start out at 1% because the property is reassessed when it is sold. Well, as good as Proposition 13 was, this led to an interesting situation when real estate was sought to be passed along to children. This is true for homes, and this is true for businesses, small businesses, and it's true for apartment buildings. What was happening is, is that when property was transferred to the child via an inheritance, when the parents died, they considered that a sale. In other words, it was a reassessment upon the full market value of the property. And what was happening, whether it was homes or apartment buildings or small businesses, the heirs who, who, who wanted to continue that Prop 13 base that their parents had were suddenly reassessed to full market value. And this became a critical problem. About the same time, Californians made it clear how 
how much they disliked the notion of a death tax. We can call this whatever we want. We can call it a wealth tax. We can call it a death tax. It's a property tax, certainly. But Californians in 1982 made it clear that they didn't like estate taxes. And in 1982, Californians banned all estate taxes, but that didn't reach to real estate. In other words, this problem with property being reassessed to full market value for the heirs of real estate was still in place. But anyway, in 1982 with Proposition 6, voters made it really clear that they didn't like anything that, that could be characterized as a death tax. So shortly after 1982 and 1986, that's when these in what we call the intergenerational protections came in. These are the protections that protect the heirs of, uh, of property owners from being reassessed to full market value if they are bequeathed property. So if you are a property, if you own a small apartment building and you don't want your kids to take a huge property tax hit when you pass away, when they receive the property because of a, a trust or a will, then, then um, this is very important to you. Uh, so how, how much people disliked this aspect of the reassessment upon change of ownership in, in, upon the death of a parent was made evident by a unanimous vote of the California legislature in 1986 with something called Proposition 58. Proposition 58 was put on the ballot by the California legislature by unanimous vote. When was the last time the California legislature did anything by unanimous vote? This is how important this issue was back in the mid 80s. And what it did, what Prop 58 did, is it simply said, if you receive property from your parents and later on your grandparents, then you would be protected against a huge reassessment uh, to full market value. In other words, think of Proposition 13, that property tax base being inherited by the children, or later on there was another initiative that extended that protection to grandchildren. So this is very important. And since 19... 86. This has been the law in the state of California, and people have made use of it. Uh, when and the assessors of the state of California are used to it, estate lawyers are used to it. They know how to structure trust in estates such that property can be conveyed to children and grandchildren without triggering a big reassessment to full market value. H how important is that today? Have you noticed how? expensive property is today, whether it's homes or income producing property, property values in California are exploding. And so this protection under Proposition 58 is very, very important. So what happened? How did we lose this? We lost it because uh, there were organizations, uh, principally the California Association of Realtors, who were very focused on another Proposition 13 issue which is called portability. Portability is the ability to take your Prop 13 base with you to another county, pretty much without limitation. And we at the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association support expanded portability. And in fact, we uh, supported an effort by the California Association of Realtors in 2018 to allow people to take their Prop 13 base with them to other counties. Well, what does this have to do with the intergenerational transfer? I'm glad you asked. They failed to qualify because they didn't run much of a campaign. They failed to qualify or pass Proposition 5. So they were told by, quite frankly, some progressive and tax and spend interests that if they wanted portability, they would have to find a way to, quote, pay for it. Well, their method of paying for it was to remove the intergenerational transfer which is how they paid for the portability. But what this meant was a massive billion dollar increase in property taxes. So when Proposition 19 passed, that achieved the realtor's primary objective of expanded portability, but it came at a huge cost. At the time, 
back, this is back just a year ago in November. This is when this happened. When this happened, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association was watching this. We were probably one of the few voices to appoint, uh, oppose Proposition 19. Even though we liked the portability, we thought that the, the price of losing the intergenerational transfer was way too high a price to pay to support it. So we opposed it. But at the same time, we were very focused on stopping another assault on Proposition 13, which was the so-called split roll, which would have been a major, massive tax increase on commercial property here in the state of California. And that particular initiative was backed by progressive interests that spent about $80 million for that campaign last November. And our side, mostly the business community, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers, and other property rights organization, uh, we raised about the same amount of money. So that was a huge battle to defeat Proposition the 15, which was the split role initiative. It came at a heavy cost, but we did win. So that was very, very important to win that campaign back in November against the split role. Unfortunately, uh, what that meant is that the proponents of Proposition 19, the loss of the intergenerational transfer, um, were able to spend a lot of money and barely pass, barely pass Proposition 19. We actually thought it would pass by a much bigger margin, but fortunately, we were able to start to get the word out when people were focused on so many other different things, on the Uber initiative, on all kinds of other initiatives. There were so many initiatives last election cycle. People's capacity to understand what was going on last November was limited. Uh, but but we tried to get the word out, and we certainly had the support of apartment apartment organizations. But unfortunately, uh, we were not successful. So what happened after Proposition 19 uh, passed? And by the way, one of the things that the proponents of Prop 19, the loss of the intergenerational transfer, one of their uh, campaign points was to say that. The only people who benefited from the intergenerational transfer protection were rich out-of-state trust fund heirs. Well, that's simply not true, as you know, because so many apartment uh, owners are, are here in California. They want to pass their property on to their children. Um, the image that this was just uh, uh, rich out-of-state property owners who wanted to give their kids uh, some additional wealth. Uh, that is tr uh, simply not the case. Uh, but unfortunately, and one of the things they pointed to was the property that was in Malibu right on the beach owned by Lloyd Bridges. Uh, for those of you who remember old television shows, Lloyd Bridges had a uh, television show called Sea Hunt. And uh, it was a very popular show and he became pretty wealthy. But he gave that property he conveyed through through his trust to his sons, two other actors who obviously make a lot of money too. You may have heard of Jeff Bridges and Bo Bridges, uh, and they inherited the property. And under Proposition 13, they were able to keep that low Proposition 13 base, which benefited them tremendously. But this was kind of the poster child for the proponents saying, look, these are just rich people that are being benefited by this. But now, as we know, that is not true. So Proposition 19 passes in November, and immediately the phones at the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association start ringing off the hook. Um, what do we do? This screws up our estate. I was hoping to convey the property to my kids and my grandkids, or I was hoping to get the property from my parents who are very old and frail right now. And if I can't, if we can't find a way to fix this, then I'm going to pay a huge uh, increase in property taxes. So the effective date of Proposition 19 was in February of 2021. So it was only from November to February that people had to rearrange their trust to the extent they were even able to try to avoid the triggering of the reassessment. A lot of people couldn't do it because uh, you could convey the property to your children, 
uh, and not trigger reassessment prior to February 16th. But that would trigger other consequences. For example, capital gains under federal estate tax law. So uh, it was it was uh, very convoluted. The whole world of trust and estates was throw, thrown into a tizzy. We were answering, we were trying our best to answer questions on this. We could not provide legal advice to anybody who called in because every trust or will is different. Uh, all we could do is try to suggest people contact their trust uh, and estate lawyers to see if they could to do something about it. And many of them couldn't. They were simply were not in a position to do that. For example, I spoke to one retired firefighter who had a very modest home, again, in Malibu, and it was not right on the water. It was about a quarter mile away. Very ordinary looking house. And he had two sons. He has two sons. He's in relatively good health right now, but he had hoped to convey that property to his two sons. But he looked on Zillow, and Zillow says that his very modest home in Malibu, that's not on the beach, is worth about $4 million. And he said, am I supposed to pick my favorite son? Because they're both working. One can't buy out the other one. But but you get the point. This threw trust and estates, the estate planning of so many people into confusion. So who was really upset about this? Certainly we were as people trying to protect Prop 13, because keep in mind what, uh, what we had under the old law was a protection, a preservation of the Prop 13 base year value. We simply made it, what, what Prop 58 did, is it simply made it inheritable so that the children could take it. So it's very important to our members as homeowners who wanted to convey their primary residence or their family farm to their children, very, very important. But other people who were very upset about this, of course, were estate attorneys. They were getting calls from their clients. And one of the things I've done is I've appeared on many webinars on these estate, uh, estate and trusts firms uh, trying to help people work through the process, and the estate lawyers would like to see what happened to Proposition 19 reversed as much as we would. Um, you, as I explained earlier, Proposition 19 was sponsored by the California Association of Realtors, but not all realtors were supportive of what they were trying to do. In fact, many realtors were on our side because they saw the dangers of losing that intergenerational uh, protection, intergenerational transfer protection. So we had many realtors from Orange County all around California, although the primary sponsor of Proposition 19 was the California Association of Realtors, a lot of realtors were on our side and they were helpful in trying to defeat it. Again, we were not successful. My, our own members, HJTA members, um, many of whom own small apartment buildings, uh, small businesses, Think of this, a small business that owns a small uh, piece of property, perhaps a family restaurant, and it's family run, and it's owned by the parents, but the kids work at the rest restaurant, and so do the grandkids. What happens when the parents pass away and want to convey that property to the next generations? It's going to be reassessed to full market value. This is one of the reasons why the Small uh, Family Business Association is fully on board. There's an organization called the Family Business Association of California. They are very much on our side. They very much want to reverse what happened with Proposition 19. As I mentioned earlier, what about renters? For people who think this is just about property owners, what happens when property, when an apartment building gets reassessed to full market value? Do you think the children of the previous owners are just going to sit by and absorb a massive tax increase? Of course not. They're going to have to raise rents to, to make sure that uh, they can just keep their heads above water. This is going to have an impact on renters. So one of the things we have to do is to convey to renters how bad Proposition 19 hurt them. And another kind of surprising twist is when the... Um, uh, when the Board of Equalization, the California Board of Equalization is in charge of administering the property tax laws in California, and they are not big fans of Proposition 19. Uh, they were used to the rules, uh, and of course, they were getting as many questions about what Prop 19 means as we were. 
And the there's a five member board and some of them are conservative, some of them are progressives, but a very progressive uh, member of the Board of Equalization from the Bay Area, again, very progressive, a minority African-American woman, um, made it clear that losing the intergenerational transfer protection was a big deal to the African-American community because as she explained in a very emotional testimony before the Board of Equalization, that she said, this is one of the few ways we, meaning minorities, can build up intergenerational wealth. Same is true with the Hispanic community, same is true with the Asian community. So the impact on minority communities who probably understand more about the desire to keep intergenerational wealth is gonna be a very important part of our coalition going forward. We sponsored legislation to try to blunt the impact of Proposition 19 uh, without success. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but let me get to the meat of what I want to talk about. And that is we received so much support for the notion of repealing what the bad part of Proposition 19, the bad part of Proposition 19, meaning the loss of the intergenerational transfer protection. So we want to go back and reinstate Proposition 58 from 1986, uh, which simply simply allows these intergenerational transfer protect intergenerational transfers to not trigger reassessment to full market value. So, in a in a way, I don't know whether some of you remember the old cartoon of um, of uh, Sherman and Peabody with a jump in a way back machine. We just want to go way back all the way just to last October of last year and reinstate the law as it was. With one exception, there's something we want to do. And that is, if you transfer a primary residence, there's no limit on the amount that you can transfer. In other words, there's no exception. Um, however, for apartment buildings and other small businesses, maximum exclusion of one million dollars so in other words you could exempt from reassessment up to one million dollars for your apartment building under the old rule but that hasn't changed since proposition 58 was enacted all those years ago so we applied an inflation factor to it so now if our effort is successful you will have an exclusion on your apartment building up to 2.4 million dollars which is basically nothing more than inflation of a $1 million from 1986 to the present day. So that's the only difference that, that, we, uh, that we are seeking from the old law, and that is to increase the exclusion for non-primary residences. So if you're, if, again, I have seen most of the people watching this are apartment owners, uh, very, very important uh, protection for you if you intend to pass your property on to uh, succeeding generations. Um, so where are we? We filed our initiative on September 30th. We've got our title and summary from the Attorney General. I wanna say something about that. In previous initiatives, the Attorney General has issued very unfair descriptions of what initiatives do. In fact, even some progressive newspapers have noted that the that the attorney general has politicized the whole issue of titles and summaries, and, he, and there's been a lot of criticism out there about that. But remarkably enough, we got a relatively objective title and summary, which is all we wanted, which meant which mentions um, allowing family properties not to be reassessed. Uh, and I th I think that that's fair. That's exactly what it does. So we've got our title and summary. Uh, we have just received, uh, less than a week ago, boxes and boxes of petitions. And um, those petitions are available uh, for signatures. We need a lot of signatures. We technically need about not, a little less than 998,000 valid signatures, which means we actually need about 1.3 million signatures. Fortunately, we've already had 500 people uh, volunteer to help us get signatures, and uh, and our volunteer network 
is very extensive. And that's one of the reasons I'm presenting this today to AOA because uh, AOA, I'm sure, will be an important part of our volunteer network in getting this uh, ballot measure uh, qualified for the ballot. We did some polling. We use a credible, very respected polling firm uh, to see if whether or not voters would support this. And the polling, the support for this is off the chart. On the, on the umbrella issue of do you want to reinstate the constitutional provision that allows parents to convey property to their children and grandchildren without triggering reassessment, that came back with 74% support. That is really off the charts. So we strongly feel that if we can qualify this initiative, it will pass. But qualification is going to be the real hurdle here because it takes so many signatures. So that's where we are. We've, we've, uh, uh, we're using the internal political operation of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. Many of you know we have staff in Los Angeles as well as staff, our attorneys and our lobbyists up here in Sacramento. We're all involved in this effort. All of our members are involved in this effort. We have 200,000 members of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. I'm sure most of them will be engaged in this effort in a very serious way. And um, so that's where we are. So what can you do to help? Well, we're gonna be working very closely with AOA and potentially use the six offices of AOA to be a, a collection point for signatures. But what's the first thing you need to do is to go to our website at hjta.org and at the top of the homepage, at the very top of the homepage is a red button that says repeal the death tax. Click on that red button. That will take you to the special page about what we're trying to do to reinstate Proposition 58, or as we're calling it right now, repeal the death tax, because um, that's really what uh, Proposition 19 did, is it imposed an unnecessary and unneeded uh, death tax on, on people who have received property from their parents. And the irony here is sad. I mean, after your parents pass away while you're in the middle of mourning, you get a tax bill from the assessor. Um, that is adding insult to injury. So um, go to our website and, uh, and join our effort. And I am more than I'm going to uh, expand my screen here. And, uh, and so um, if there's any question you have, I'm available for uh, as long as this takes, as long as AOA folks, uh, as Dan and Jeff want me to speak on this, to answer questions. So uh, I will turn it back to Jeff or Dan, whoever wants to, to pipe in right now. Well, thank you so much, John, for that. And um, so right now we're gonna, while you type in your questions, go ahead, type those in, and we're going to hear from our sponsor and we'll be right back. We'll be right back in a minute here. So just type those questions in and we'll be right back partnered with AOA now for some years to bring our ratio utility billing services to membership. And what really sets us apart, aside from quality service and taking great care of your residents and billing the pack fairly and accurately for their fair share of utilities, is that we have no minimums. So that means if you've got a duplex or a single family home with an ADU, we're happy to help facilitate the utility bill back on your behalf. So we would love for you to get in touch and join all of these happy customers in using our service and celebrating conservation, but also increasing your net operating income. Livable.com slash AOA is where you can find more information and ways to get in touch with us. Look forward to getting some time scheduled and to telling you more about the program and how you can do your part to promote conservation. All the best and enjoy the live stream. Thanks to Livable for, for supporting uh, this live stream specifically and uh, knowing them very much. They're, they are behind you, and I would, I would bet money that they're also <laughs> members of your association as well. And here we go. We have our question from J.C. Harding. Hello, John. We would very much like to contribute to help 
uh, for repealing this part of Prop 19 or of all of it, if necessary? Where do we mail our, you checks? If you go to that website and click on the red banner uh, that says repeal the death tax, it will take you to, to a donation page. And I'm glad you asked that question because contributions to an initiative campaign have to be handled differently than contributions to Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. So the checks would have to be made to repeal the death tax, a project of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And because it's a political effort, you would have to provide certain information like an employer. If you have an employer, you'd have to put down if you're self-employed because the Secretary of State and the Fair Political Practices Commission wants, you know, wants information um, on, on who's contributing to political campaigns. So it's a segregated amount, but that's also assurance that any money that we get into that account will be spent directly on repealing uh, this aspect of Proposition 19. Great. And hey, thank you so much for putting your money where your mouth is. We all think, we all think that everything that John is saying here is good, but um, it's a whole nother thing to open up the, open up the checkbook. And definitely, please give it to Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. That's why we even have them come on, because we're hoping that you'll get behind them uh, with, with your hands and feet and also with, with um, financially as well. All right, Island Breeze. If we leave property in the trust after parents die, will it be reassessed? Um, yes, because the creation of a trust has no impact on the rules of Proposition 19 or the rules of Proposition 13. Um, I've got a trust myself, uh, but but put the, rule, the rules for Proposition 13 and Prop 19 disregard the creation of a trust. It's treated the same way. So I know that, uh, that when property is conveyed into a trust, you do not lose your Prop 13 value. Uh, the law is very clear uh, on that, but if the trust conveys the property to the children once the uh, people of uh, the parents pass away, then under 19, it says it will be reassessed. So what you need to do is support this. And if this passes, when the property is conveyed from the trust to the children, it will not receive a reassessment to full market value. So that's, again, um, we get that question a lot, whether the trust has a bearing, the creation of a trust has any bearing on this. And uh, we don't believe so, at least not for the purposes of Proposition 13 or Prop 19. Yeah, uh, and there's so many comments in here just about how extremely misleading Prop 19 was. And even on, you know, even using the Howard Jarvis name, like I think they even used uh, the name of someone who was on the board, if I remember right, uh, you know, and it was just, and I would speak to myself, oh, that's not, they don't agree with that, but yeah, it, man, it was misleading. Yeah, yes, Re regrettably, they used a former employee of ours to make it look, and they had his name on some of the literature, and it was, um, it was so disappointing. Fortunately, that person has no future in Sacramento because uh, I mean I don't care. This is not a conservative or liberal issue. This is you just don't do that. Um, it that was bad form. Yeah, yeah. Okay, MRC. If the property owner died well before Prop 19 was voted in, but estate is still in probate, are heirs grandfathered into the old law, or does Prop 19 apply? If if the property is actually conveyed after February, you're out of luck. Hmm. Unfortunately, I mean, it's, it, it, it's when the conveyance is. And so if the conveyance happened after, afterwards, and I, I, I guess the question is, were there situations where property was in probate when Prop 19 passed? I bet you a lot of people tried to move probate along quickly to, to meet that February 16th deadline to make sure that they could they could receive the property. But if not, if it's still in probate, the time has expired. What needs to happen is this needs to pass. Oh, I should mention that if this passes, the law goes back and you can reapply for that exemption. So this oh, is wow. th 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 this does have retroactive effect. So if this passes, 
and you could have claimed the lower base under the old law, you can reapply to your county assessor and get your old base back. The only thing you won't get, and this is a question that the, the Department of Finance and the legislative analysts had for us, they said, was it your intention to provide rebates during that during that one year process between when Prop 19 passes and this initiative passes, if it passes? And we said no, because Prop 19 was was law. Nobody challenged its legality, but it is clear and everybody recognizes that you may have lost a, a little bit of higher tax for one year, but you can reapply for that original base that your parents had. And my guess is it's a lot lower than what you're paying right now. For sure. All right, Lily on YouTube. Why was not this explained before misinformation given by Prop 19 proponents? Uh, we did our best. As I said, the, the election uh, last, last cycle was very, there was, there was so much political noise, the, you know, the, the, the presidential race, all the stuff that was going on. Uh, we tried to get the word out. Again, I think we spent, uh, the Jarvis Association spent more financial resources opposing 19 than anybody else. I think we spent, I, I don't know the exact amount, but the proponents of 19 spent $50 million spreading the disinformation that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we, uh, uh, we didn't ever think we could overcome that. Uh, you know, there's, there's, what is it? Coulda, shoulda, woulda. Uh, had, had we known that it was gonna be as close as it was, we probably would have shifted some of our focus away from split role and onto stopping uh, 19, but you know, that's water under the bridge. You know, we have to make these political decisions on the fly and use our best judgment. And we were looking at that $50 million from the proponents and all the mail they were putting on the TV ads and we just couldn't, couldn't match it. So, um, but you're right. There was a lot of disinformation out there. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, editorial boards were opposed. I mean, even some of the progressive ones were opposed for different reasons, but they noted the, the deceptive nature of the campaign, and I think it offended a lot of people. Right. And we have to remember also, too, at that time, was not uh, Prop 15 and Prop 21 on the ballot? Yes, rank, rank control yeah. and split role. So... My guess is, as apartment owners, you are pretty focused on the rent control initiative as much as anything else, So, and, and which is perfectly understandable. But again, when your attention is so divided, it's very hard to focus on one thing. Right. We, we put a bunch of money, definitely a whole lot of, a ton of cash in, from the political, our political action fund right. um, into the signs and, and getting that out and the lawn signs and the bumper stickers and trying to get the word out. And uh we thought you guys did a great job and we did get a few calls, but, um, you know, we just said we would tell people, Hey, it's your call. Do you want to help out future generations or do you want to help out yourself? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of well, wishy. well now we have the choice because we've successfully defeated the expansion rent control. And now we can get, we can take back the protections that we had a year ago. So the best of both right. worlds, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, there's some, Bad, uh, bad uh, propo propositions coming down the pike too. With uh, yes. yeah, so there's a whole lot we're going to have to deal with and spend money on this year as well. It seems like right. <laughs> oh man, here we go. All right, so uh, Marriott Management. Just a shout out to um, HJTA. We have been supporting HJTA for years. You are a blessing to all property owners. Thank and you. that is exactly why we have you guys on. That, thank <laughs> and, you so much. I and here's it. Leonard. What is the governor's view on this? Will he help? <laughs> um, you know, I, I regrettably, I think the, the, the governor um, is very much influenced by progressive interests. And because this would be a significant tax reduction, um, it would prevent government from re reassessing property. So it's, this, would, this would be a big property tax 
cut. And I don't see the majority party in California supporting this. I do think it could be very much like Proposition 13, where all the major entrenched interests was against it, uh, were against it, but it still passed by 66% because the people were just fed up. Uh, everywhere we go, um, people are very concerned about this. And Jeff, as I mentioned earlier, it's um, a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the minority groups. We've already had a, an an op-ed uh, written by um, the uh, African American Chamber of Commerce president, um, Mr. Lombard, who uh, understands uh, that for the minority business community, this is a big deal. And uh, mm -hmm. we, as we get closer, you know, in the coming weeks. We're going to be expanding our coalition uh, very, very broadly to get the word out. And, and, and again, I'm glad somebody mentioned um, how do you donate? Because, yeah. yes, we need the signatures, but, but um, financial resources are going to be critical for the printing costs and also uh, to, to help our volunteers get those signatures. And, and um, so, so there may be people who are just not in a position to get signatures, you know, they'll be more than willing to sign one themselves and maybe have five or six other, of their friends sign it. That's great. We need a lot. But but if people are uncomfortable getting signatures, the donations are going to be very, very critical. Right. And you guys have just tremendous resources for when they actually do something like that, how to do it and how to ins give instructions and everything. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. The, instru the, the instruction sheet for the petitions themselves. Pe oh, people ask, can they download the petition? No, you cannot. The yeah. petitions are governed by very strict rules in the California codes. It's actually when you get a petition, you'll notice when you unfold it, it's like six pages because you have to have the full text of the initiative in the petition. So it has to be printed very carefully because of this. Any mistakes those signatures on that petition would be invalid. So the peti petitions have to come from us, but we are going to print as many as we need to, uh, to make sure that this thing qualifies. Well, and that's uh, almost a million signatures. Yes. <laughs> well, it will be over a million because they'll, they'll have those ones that are discounted. Right. Right. But, but, but one, th one thing we've noticed is that in the signatures that groups like ours and yours, we get have very high validity rates. The uh, signatures validity rate, if you just stand out in front of Walmart and just get signatures, maybe 50%. But when you do it through the networks that you know, through apartment owners and other property owners and homeowners, the validity rate could be 85% uh, or higher uh, because, you know, the, the people who care about this are people who own property. Right. We write really slowly and carefully <laughs> yeah. out right, of right. fear of it not being counted. <laughs> right, right. Here we go. Fred on YouTube. Have there been any opinion polls or sampling done to fine tune the campaign? Absolutely. Uh, uh, we did, a, we stress tested the message points using uh, a very good polling firm, as I mentioned earlier, the name of that firm is Basilis. And uh, they, they were the polling firm that successfully um, was involved in the rejecting split role. And I, I think they were also had a role in the rent control initiative on our side too. They know the Prop 13 issue very well. And we did a number of issues. And when you do polling, um, you ask, you know, you have the description and then you have an initial test. Then you have a, after pre presenting some of the, uh, the different arguments, you, you have a, do another poll, and then at the end, you say the final poll. And as we explain the elements of this, the support just kept on going higher and higher. So again, that is very encouraging uh, for a successful effort. Great. Okay, no option is the name of the- <laughs> <laughs> No option. <laughs> the handle on YouTube. If the properties are in limited partnership and LLC, Will they be reassessed after parents die? Um, not sure, because usually the the um, uh, the the corporate entity, I, I believe, I don't know how you would split that up. I know that if it's funneled through a trust, you're fine. It depends on how many partners there are. For example, if it were a husband-wife 
partnership only and, and because the protection is for the lawful heirs uh, that might be excludable but I would talk to your I would talk to your estate lawyer and your and your uh, property rights lawyer uh, for a final answer on that one because I'm not I'm not sure how to work I would be a little bit cautious about that there may be a way to do it but um, we're usually talking about property that's owned by individuals and even if it's in a trust it's still owned by individuals so there may be some protection there I'd have to I'd have to do some more more research on that Jeff okay and um, I, you know I got I sorry guys I forgot to mention that the, the our AOA dues are going to be going up in January and any member if they they can tack on one two three years right now for the regular price and so I, I forgot to mention that and I just we're just trying to get that out there just to give people fair warning and let them uh, kind of get the better price while they can so sorry. <laughs> I forgot about that one. And um, anyway, so here we go back to the, the questions. Nick, is the HJTA objective to achieve a 2.4 million valuation exemption for all property or for apartments only? Uh, all non-primary residences. So it would be a small business, uh, a restaurant, um, a auto shop. Um, so it's commercial property. 2.4, but if it's the primary residence, there's no limit. Great. All right, CB. What if the families put properties under LLC? Will that keep the same tax base when owners pass? Again, not sure about the impact of an LLC, depending on who the, who the shareholders are of the LLC. Again, this is for... Uh, uh, and, and I'm not sure there is partial, suppose you had some, uh, a parent and, um, and they're in partnership with somebody else outside the family. I'm not sure whether or not there'd be a partial uh, exemption. Uh, I seem to recall the answer to that is no. But again, I would talk to your estate lawyers on that one. Great. Uh, QV Properties. When might this be repealed? Is there a date and is there a full list of emails we can copy and paste into a letter so we can write our legislators? Great. I love that. I love that question. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, in addition to the initiative, which is bypassing the legislature entirely, we have a legislator, uh, Kevin Kiley, an assemblyman from uh, up here in Northern California, who uh, is pushing a proposed constitutional amendment as a, what they call an ACA, Assembly Constitutional Amendment. Now, uh, again, given the legislature being what it is, a very progressive institution, uh, they're not inclined to support uh, tax reductions. But if there is a perception that we can qualify this initiative, the legislature may want to enter into discussions to do what we're trying to do by themselves. Now, we want full exclusions, but if the legislature wants to take this on, we would be more than welcome to do that. But I think we've got to really apply the heat to them before that can happen. And quite frankly, Jeff, I'm not inclined to cut any kind of weak deal with the legislature. We want to restore the law as it was with the one exception of increasing the ex exclusion for non-residential property being the 2.4 million. Right. I just, I like, uh, just the fact that they're ready to do something. <laughs> so that's what's great. Well, if we put the heat on, you know, we can, you know, let's get the heat. We need to elevate this issue with everybody. Uh, and uh, I think as we progress in the coming months, uh, we have until mid-April to turn in the signatures. That sounds like a long ways away. It's not. It's We've got to get there very, very quickly. Right. Wow. Yeah, if you think about that, that's like over every month having more than a hundred thousand. Well, what, what it works out to, I've done the math. Or almost 200,000. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's 7,500 valid signatures every day for 180 days. Okay. Let's 7, go. Let's, let's go. Let's We're go. on it. We're on it. I, I, you know, again, I think we can get there because we have some, some activists who will easily go out and get a hundred signatures a day without batting an eye. So uh, we have some very motivated, motivated people. 
that no one can sit around. We all, we all need to work on this one. That's right. All right. Okay, so um, if it's repealed, why would we need to reapply uh, for the for, to get the better tax? You'd have to tax re, yeah, you'd have to reapply uh, because under the old law, you'd have to apply if you wanted the intergenerational transfer protection that we've always had. You would st you still needed to apply to your county assessor saying, "Hey, I got this property from my parents. They passed away. It's now mine." I want their Prop 13 base. So even under the old law, you had to apply. And when I talked, when I gave a speech to the county assessors, they said basically they'd just use the old form that they used prior to last November. So you'd, you'd have to apply because otherwise what's going to happen is the assessors would notice uh, that there's been a recording and that the previous owners aren't the same as the new and their automatic default position is to reassess unless they get an application. You have to be proactive to get that. So again, that's nothing new. It's the same as the old law. So that's why you would have to reapply. Great. And Leonard was asking, when could this get onto the ballot? And around what date is your goal? I know you stated, you, you answered half of that question. Yeah, the, uh, we, need to get the, we need to get the signatures in by mid-April. And, and if we qualify, it will be on the ballot in November of 2022, so a year. And again, we need to hurry. <laughs> All right, and then just a comment that um, JC gave, a, they made a donation of $2,000 and just asked right. that you keep them informed. So that's awesome. We'll, we'll do. Another thing that you can do on that website on the repeal the death tax is to sign up to get the constant emails. We'll try not to overwhelm you with e emails, but things are going to be breaking very fast. And so if you sign up for email alerts on that, on that website, as well as HJTA for other issues, uh, that's a good way to stay informed because we will, uh, we, we will keep everybody informed as to our progress. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I, there are, we've answered all the questions that we have here. There may be one, one or two that slip in um, as we wrap up, but John, thank you so much for sharing with us, and uh, we're we're definitely behind you and and H H J T A for sure. Well, thank you very much, and and I will I, I will reinforce <laughs> your request that people send in the dues to your organization because you've been so uh, AOA has been fabulous on all the fights we've been in. So uh, you, you know, I'll put in a plug for you guys as well. So please do that if you if you uh, if you're currently a member. Please re up to a to what we consider one of the premier apartment organizations in California. Wow, thank you for the kind words for sure. And and uh, yeah, definitely do that before year end because you're going to get the best deal. There's no per unit fee, uh, so even better. We're uh, kind of we're we're definitely the low cost organization, and just every day we're trying to improve and um, just get you the information that you need because this thing it's just complicated these days. So in a couple of weeks, we have that live stream about why it's good to have renter's insurance. So uh, you can tune into that one. If you're unfortunately have to have to make a go to small claims court to get back your rent, you could look at the live stream from a couple of weeks ago and uh, Franco Simone, um, landlord law, uh, landlord tenant law attorney in San Diego. He did a great job with that. And um, anyway, we're just going to do what we can to keep you in the know. Uh, stay posted, look at the magazine, and uh, if you're not getting it, just <laughs> time to become a member. And uh, thanks again, everyone. And um, yeah, we'll see you next or not next week. Have a really good Thanksgiving. So much to be thankful for. And it's just such a good time to be thankful and also to be generous. And so hopefully you'll be able to, to um, get into the holiday spirit <laughs> with us. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.